Good evening, good morning. Uh, welcome to PSSL 6251 uh, Interagency Cooperation. Uh, I'm Rowan Sharma. I will be your professor for this next eight weeks. And for those of you who haven't had me before, uh, I'm not sure if you've had other professors do this in the class, but I like to have a little bit more of a person-to-person uh, -person interaction for my online courses. So uh, I like to post these YouTube videos every week or so so you can uh, you know, see my face, get my thoughts or so on the course, and, and take it from there. So we have a little bit more of a face-to-face -face interaction. Um, so welcome to the course. And uh, I think everyone's been enrolled in this program. So, uh, uh, But if you haven't or you've, you've skipped a few semesters, welcome to the, the, the PSSL program, the Safety and Security Leadership Program. And for some of you, welcome to GW. I hope this uh, this program and this course kind of fulfill both your uh, academic and educational experience as well as your, your professional uh, experience as well. Uh, this course is going to look at uh, how agencies cooperate, uh, how they cooperate both horizontally and vertically. And what I mean by horizontally, it means how different agencies at a certain level cooperate, how they, whether it's the CIA, FBI, or whether it's the military, the Department of Homeland Security, or even at the local level, how police, police and firefighters and, and, and disaster relief folks, how they cooperate. So that's, that's kind of horizontal, how agencies cooperate. We also look vertically, and that's how the federal government cooperates with state governments, which cooperate with local, who cooperate with, at the international level. Uh, so that's kind of the vertical levels of, of agency cooperation that we'll be looking at for the next uh, eight weeks so eight weeks or so. So we'll look at how they cooperate, collaborate, and most importantly, how they fail, particularly when we're talking about things like Hurricane Katrina. Uh, why do they fail? You know, whose fault is it? Where were the uh, fissures in the in the levels of cooperation, and how can we can how can we improve for the next time? Um, this is designed to, again, prepare you guys to be leaders uh, in homeland security, homeland defense, emergency management, uh, and think beyond your day-to-day -day job. So if your day-to-day -day job uh, is, is police or an intelligence agency, uh, that's fine, but you also need to look at the system failures and system successes that you'll, you'll need to know when you rise, hopefully, that's hopefully why you're in this program, is to to, to advance in your careers and you have to look at the overall system failures and system success points for a particular agency and that's that's where it gets more difficult and hopefully this this course will, will open your eyes to that fact um, just uh, give an introduction myself uh, again I'm Rowan Sharma I currently work at a place called the Defense Threat Reduction Agency DITRA for short and we are the uh, Department of Defense's counter WMD rel, uh, arm is probably the best way to speak of it. I'm a red team analyst where I look at adversary uh, procurement, adversarial actions that they might do in the, in the WMD realm. Um, uh, before that, I've worked at Homeland Security, Transportation Security Administration. I know people tend to get a laugh at that, uh, that organization, but I worked there for, for a while, and I also worked IED Defeat uh, for the Department of Defense at the Joint IED Defeat Organization. Uh, before that, I was an Army officer for seven years, so I worked uh, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, well, I can at least sympathize with a lot of the issues that if you're on active duty or just got out of active duty that you, you face. Um, so. With that being said, if you guys can uh, just in your student lounge, you know, give an introduction to yourself as well as, uh, you know, what you hope to achieve in this class, in this program. And the one thing I actually ask is something unique about yourself, uh, something that I would remember you by. Uh, just to give you something unique about me, uh, you know, I don't know, I usually get a different response from the audience depending on your age, but I grew up three doors down from Joey Buttafuoco. Uh, the Long Island Lolita, Amy Fisher, uh, if you could remember that. Uh, and he, he grew up, or he, he lived three doors down from me. His wife got shot three doors down from me. Uh, and I was a young person, in eighth grade at the time, and it was quite a controversy. So 
tell me something unique about yourself like that, that, that I'll remember. And hopefully you will remember that about me uh, as we go forward, forward. So the syllabus, I just want to cover that for a few seconds. Uh, there should be one textbook, your international police cooperation by our pristine program director. Uh, you can buy that or you can download that, that online on your Kindle and your iPads. Um, and you'll, you will need that for this course. You also should be getting, if you have not already got the course pack from GW, uh, that should be mailed to you with all the articles uh, for, for this class. Um, you also have discussion PowerPoint slides uh, or lecture PowerPoint slides in each chapter or each unit as you as you progress through this uh, progress through this course. So you should the text should be clear. Uh, the group discussions again, none of you are new to GW, so none of this should be new to you. There'll be uh, two per section. Uh, it is an intensive course, so there'll be two per section. I expect you to post by Wednesday and then use Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday to respond to your classmates. Uh, five to eight responses total. So two posts, five to eight responses total uh, to your classmates. Uh, and, and try and be pointed in your discussions. Don't try and just regurgitate the, uh, the, the notes or the, the text. Integrate your experiences, integrate your analysis, integrate your opinions uh, into the discussion boards and, and be a little controversial. That's that's okay. That's why the discussion boards are there. Um, so yeah, you know, do that so you can kind of get uh, more of a holistic discussion for each section. Um, there are four papers. Uh, three of them are 12 to 1500 words. One is 2000 to 2500 words. Uh, these papers are meant to be concise, short papers. Uh, that doesn't require, you know, tons of outside research, shouldn't require pretty much any outside research that get to the point and get your point across real quickly. Uh, that's in the real world. That's how it works. Uh, no one writes 20 page papers in the real world. Uh, you write a paper that gets the attention of your audience fast so that person can, can go ahead and read the rest of your paper. And your paper should have a strong thesis, and every one of these papers asks you to take a position one way or another, so it should have a strong thesis, and every sentence, every paragraph should introduce more evidence that backs up your thesis. There should not be any floating paragraphs, there should not be any, any ambiguity. These are very short papers. Every sentence has to earn its way onto your paper. If it's a sentence that doesn't back up your thesis, it should not be there uh, to begin with. In addition to having evidence, you should also have rebuttal arguments. Uh, so address what you think someone who's on the opposite end of the argument is going to say. Address those arguments as well. Um, so those, your papers again, short, concise, to the point, and, and, and uh, make sure there's strong thesis and evidence for each one of them. Uh, in addition to the four papers, there will be a final simulation during week five. I'll break you guys into groups uh, and you will do a, a you, there's a simulation in the final that involves you guys writing a paper, interacting with your classmates, uh, asking questions and issues from your classmates so that you uh, can uh, uh, complete it and everyone gets the same grade at the end. Um, and that, that simulation is, is your pretty much your final exam. You'll be doing it during week eight. Um, and then finally, I, I just want to say this is a challenging course. I've taught, you know, a few courses in this program, uh, and this is a challenging one. If you fall behind by one week, uh, you will probably fall behind, period. So it's not, you know, this whole program isn't designed to be a commuter program where you, or a, a, a you know, a, a correspondence school program. Uh, where you just do the assignments and that's it. You have to go week by week, do the readings, interact with your classmates, do the papers. And you have to do this. You have to stay on top of it. It is not something that you can do just, hey, I mean, dedicate two hours on Friday nights and do everything then. No, it is something that's going to require you to work probably every day. Uh, or it, it will require you to pretty much work every day uh, and interact with your classmates and 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 study and focus pretty consistently. If you fall behind one week, 
you're going to be in in really big trouble. So make sure you stay on top of everything as we as we progress. So what I want to cover for week one, uh, I just want to talk about the fusion centers. Uh, that will be part of your discussion section and part of the lecture for for this week. Uh, the fusion centers are uh, Department of Homeland Security's attempt to integrate intelligence across the interagency. So I talked about horizontal. This is kind of a vertical attempt to share intelligence, coordinate counterterrorism from the federal side to the state down to the local cop on the beat. Um, it's designed to integrate, again, intel, intelligence data from multiple sources. The brainchild came from 9-11. Um, and I'm actually going to send you a quick PBS Frontline uh, that covers the fusion centers that will illustrate it in, in more detail. But the, uh, uh, the fusion centers are... Uh, you know, they, they occurred, one of the 9-11 hijackers was actually arrested, uh, or he was pulled over in a traffic jam. And you know, the cop looked up his data, no, no records, no felonies, no other driving hazards, and let him on his way. Now the fusion centers designed, now this person was on a terrorist watch list, I should say, and the fusion centers are designed to push that watch listing function down to the cop on the beat. So if Joe, Joe Hamad is wanted for terrorism, the cop on the beat pulls him over uh, in a traffic incident. He can do a background check instantaneously and say, damn, that guy's a terrorist. Let's arrest him. Um, that, that's kind of the idea for the fusion centers. Um, they have several advantages. Before I go into disadvantages, and again, you'll take a position on this uh, in your discussion section. But yeah, the advantages are they push watch listing down. And watch listing are those terrorist watch lists when you go to the airport, uh, when you get on a plane, you're, you're matched against the terrorist watch list uh, to make sure that you're not on the no-fly list and you're not going to you know, cause any damage. Uh, great when you get on the airport, but for people who don't fly, there's no mechanism to, to, to uh, arrest them or to figure out who's on a watch list or figure out when watch listed people are, uh, you know, what they're doing. You know, the Zarnaya brothers, those knuckleheads in Boston, they were on a watch list. Uh, and they were actually detained by the police. But even then, even with the fusion center there, the watch listing function was not pushed down. So the, the, the hope is that if the fusion center is done correctly, watch listing functions will be pushed down to the lowest level. Um, you can also, with the fusion centers, cross have cross-jurisdictional issues. We'll talk about that this week. Uh, instead of Nashville County Police just looking at Nashville, the Nashville fusion center will integrate you know, uh, crime, or mainly terrorism, across different states, different international, different jurisdictions. Uh, so you can get a bigger picture. And then finally, uh, the fusion centers can serve as a command post. And we saw this during Hurricane Katrina. Um, the, you know, if, if we need to have a place where federal, state, local officials need to congregate, the fusion centers could be a great, a great place to do that. And many people say that they're worth that investment. The disadvantages are pretty big too, and you know there's uh, they're expensive, two to three billion dollars already spent on them. Uh, that is a lot of money uh, in, in Washington speak. Um, they're duplicative. Uh, we have FBI Joint Terrorism Task Forces in each state. Uh, this was started in the 90s or 80, late 80s, 90s, and the FBI JTTFs that are you know if you ask what the JTTF does and the Fusion Center does. You'll probably get the same answer, so it's kind of duplicative. And then finally, and this brings us to the discussion section, is that they violate civil rights. That they, because they're pushed down to the local level, they 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 violate your civil liberties, violate privacy, uh, things that cops can't do, the fusion centers can do, uh, and that that is a main issue. So I'm going to push a video that talks about the fusion centers out. Uh, to you guys. So please watch that after hearing this discussion and I look forward to your discussion board questions.